So as I think you all know, as of January 1st, 2016, the ASEAN Economic Community, or AEC, came into existence. Um, and one of the mantras of the ASEAN Economic Community, in light of the adoption of the ASEAN Charter um, a number of years before, is that ASEAN is now a rules-based community. And <coughs> part of what I want to do today is consider <coughs> what it means to say that ASEAN is a rules-based community, and now that we have an ASEAN economic community that formally exists, what is the rule of law? What is the role of the rule of law within that economic community? So if we read various ASEAN documents that have been promulgated over the past few years, we see that the leaders of ASEAN have promised their citizens a rules-based community that rests upon the rule of law, good governance, democracy, and the promotion and protection of human rights. Those are principles that are enshrined in the ASEAN Charter, which is a legally binding instrument. The leaders of ASEAN have said in a number of declarations and statements that such a rules-based community is necessary to ensure peace, prosperity, and sustainable development for the peoples of ASEAN. They further promise in the uh, blueprints for the ASEAN Economic Community and the, in the blueprints for the other two pillars of ASEAN, uh, the political security pillar, the social cultural pillar, that this rules-based community will be, and this is the key phrase that's used, both people-centered and people-oriented, and it will be achieved by 2025 as articulated in the three blueprints that are collected in an ASEAN Vision 2025 document. So what I'd like to ask today is, what are the challenges and the prospects for the realization of these lofty promises that the um, heads of state of the 10 ASEAN member states have enshrined in these documents? And what I want to do in particular is to focus upon the rule of law in ASEAN as a key component for the rules-based community and for the realization of the charter principles of democracy, good governance, and the protection of human rights. And what I would like to argue in general is that ASEAN has not yet put in place a structure capable of fulfilling the rule of law mandate of the Charter and Blueprints, and that such a structure is a necessity for the realization of the larger goals of the ASEAN economic community in particular, and more generally for the ASEAN Vision 2025. And um, concomitantly, I will raise the issue of whether without such a mechanism, the rule of law at the regional level is possible when the rule of law is so noticeably absent at the national level in so many ASEAN member states. And this is a question that one doesn't ask in ASEAN. Completely avoided. So um, what I'll do is begin with a very brief overview of the obligations on the rule of law and human rights that ASEAN has assumed under the Charter and other instruments, and then look at the way in which the Blueprints 2025 promise to implement or don't promise to implement these obligations. And I will conclude with very brief consideration of that if, AS if ASEAN is serious about the rule of law, what ASEAN bodies should be tasked or have been tasked with the responsibility for implementing the rule of law and human rights principles and obligations of the Charter. So um, before talking about the Charter, maybe we should actually ask, why, the, why is the rule of law important? Why is the rule of law important for the ASEAN economic community? Um, I mean, clearly the rule of law has some value in itself as a foundational principle of human rights, but why is it important for an economic community? And 
I think it's a relevant question because there appear to be some ASEAN member states that seem to think that they can achieve higher levels of development without the rule of law. And some of them may even be convinced that the rule of law and human rights are impediments to rapid economic development. So that, of course, is a huge topic in itself, but I just want to make a couple of points. So in the ASEAN vision, a key component to achieve the prosperity and development promised to the peoples of ASEAN is the ASEAN economic community that will allow the free movement of goods, skilled labor, capital, and so forth across the borders of ASEAN and will encourage cross-border trade and investment and foreign investment in ASEAN. Why is the rule of law important to that economic regime? I mean, it's clear why the rule of law is important for the realization of human rights, because without the rule of law and the political will to use the law to implement and enforce human rights, human rights remain paper promises. But the, rule, the importance of the rule of law extends beyond human rights. The rule of law cuts across all three pillars of ASEAN. Of course, ASEAN is notoriously sort of inept at dealing with cross-pillar issues, but there are initi initiatives underway now to promote what they call um, inter-pillar dialogue. So typically, rule of law issues, when they come up, come up within the political security pillar and not in the economic pillar. But the rule of law is essential for the realization of the potential of the ASEAN economic community. The 2015 blueprints commit ASEAN to a rules-based community, and how, might we ask, can we have a rules-based community without the rule of law? If we look at the ASEAN economic blueprint 2016 to 2025, what we will find is a wide range of legislative and regulatory action that will be required at the, at the regional level and the national level to implement the economic agenda. But without an effective rule of law regime at the national level in every, every ASEAN member state, this broad framework that's designed to enable cross-border transactions, increase foreign investment, permit the free flow of goods, capital, services, and so forth, cannot be fully realized. The regulative regime, to be effective, will have to be implemented and enforced in a transparent and predictable manner. And legal disputes will have to be resolved through a judicial process that is seen by investors as fair, impartial, independent, and substantially free from corruption. And I don't need to tell all of you that those conditions are only found to a limited degree in ASEAN and, um, as we'll see, um, um, in very few ASEAN member states. The greater the impingement of the rule of law through corruption, political interference, the lack of judicial independence, nepotism and influence peddling, and many other factors, the greater will be the drag that impedes and holds back the implementation of the goals of the ASEAN economic community. Predictability and certainty in legal transactions, litigation, and judicial decision making are prerequisites for maximizing investment and an ec economic development. And predictability and certainty in legal regimes are key elements produced by the rule of law. Predictability and certainty in the judicial sphere, we have to emphasize, can only be accomplished through the instantiation of the rule of law. And that's why it and its intimate counterpart, anti-corruption initiatives, must be an absolute priority for the development of the full potential of the ASEAN economic community. The real question, I think, is whether ASEAN member states will muster the, the political will to tackle the many impediments to the rule of law and to tackle corruption at the national level that makes, those are the factors that make the promise of a rules-based community that provides prosperity, for the citizens of ASEAN, a vision rather than a reality.
So let's now look briefly at the Charter. The ASEAN Charter marks the transition of ASEAN from a political association to a regional organization with a legal identity. It's a legally binding instrument that is the foundation of ASEAN today. If we look at the Charter, we find that the rule of law features in a number of places, beginning with the preamble, which provides that in adopting the Charter, the member states are, quote, adhering to the principles of democracy, the rule of law, and good governance, end quote. And those principles are taken up um, in Articles 1 and 2 of the Charter. On the one hand, then, the commitment to the rule of law in the Charter could not be clearer. On the other hand, however, as um, we might think is typical, there are other Charter principles that give member states considerable leeway in how to interpret and implement the rule of law within their own national traditions, cultures, political systems, and so on and so forth. And then we add to that the consensus rule and the non-interference principle um, and we are where we are um, in ASEAN. The ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, which was enacted, adopted a couple of years after the Charter, reaffirms the commitment of ASEAN to the Charter principles. And that commitment was reiterated in the Phnom Penh Statement in 2013 of the ASEAN Heads of State at the Phnom Penh Summit when they adopted the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. And the Phnom Penh Statement of ASEAN leaders says, quote, reaffirming ASEAN's commitment to the purposes and principles as enshrined in the Charter, including the principles of democracy, the rule of law, and good governance, end quotation. What's interesting, having just quoted the Phnom Penh Declaration th by which the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration was adopted is that the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration nowhere explicitly refers to the rule of law, which is a rather striking um, omission given the principles of the Charter and the um, commitment of the Phnom Penh Summit. The term does not appear in the body of the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration although there are a number of components of the rule of law involving fair trial rights and so forth that are enumerated. The further problem with the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration is that what one principle appears to guarantee, another principle appears to qualify, relativize, or undermine. Thus, for example, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration provides on the one hand that, quote, all human rights are universal, indivisible, interdependent and interrelated. However, in the very same paragraph, it is also provided that the realization of those rights, quote, must be considered in the regional and national context, <laughs> bearing in mind different political, economic, legal, social, cultural, historical, and religious backgrounds. If we translate that into plain language, what it means is that the Declaration recognizes the existence in the abstract of these rights, but the implementation of them is completely at the discretion of the individual member states that consider that each will consider how implementation is to be qualified by, quote, the contextual requirements of national security, public order, public health, public safety, public morality, as well as the general welfare of the peoples in a democratic society, end quotation. We could hardly imagine a broader saving clause that would justify, um, as many ASEAN member states do, laws, regulations, and practices that render nugatory both the rule of law and many of the broad guarantees of the so-called universal and inalienable rights guaranteed by other provisions of the Declaration. What are the implications of this for the ASEAN economic community? The implications, I would argue, are very real because respect for and instantiation of the rule of law across ASEAN would, as I've said before, appear to be a prerequisite for the fulfillment of the economic goals of the ASEAN economic community. And as we well know, um, 
in a number of ASEAN member states, foreign investors, for example, or investors from other states are disinclined to invest because of rampant corruption and many other factors which um, create risks that are unacceptable to many investors and companies. Beyond that, we have to ask, what would it actually mean to have a rules-based community without the rule of law? What would that look like? To what extent would that actually be or could be a rules-based a, a rules community? So the question that one doesn't ask at ITER meetings or other ASEAN meetings is, can one develop a rules-based community and the rule of law at the ASEAN level when at the national level so many ASEAN member states are so far from realizing the rule of law within their own border? How does ASEAN in fact propose to create the rules-based community that has become the mantra of ASEAN discourse? So let's look at the ASEAN blueprints 2025 that articulate the ASEAN vision for the realization of the community over the next decade. Now, if we look at the economic, the economic community blueprint, what we will find is that because there are a vastly greater number of ASEAN instruments in the economic pillar than in any other pillar, the ASEAN economic community blueprint 2025 contains a far more detailed and comprehensive scheme for implementation than do the other two blueprints. What it does not contain, however, is any kind of outline for how the rule of law or a rules-based community will provide the necessary foundation for the effective implementation of the economic goals and regulatory schemes of the blueprint. How can you have effective regulatory schemes without the rule of law and an effective judicial process? So the economic community blueprint does set the goal of developing, among other things, what it, good governance and what it terms transparency, but the rule of law is nowhere mentioned um, in the economic community blueprint. So while good governance in the charter is treated as an interrelated principle with the rule of law, that is not the case in the economic community blueprint, and the connection with good governance here is trans transparency. So transparency may be a sort of more acceptable stand-in term for, um, for the rule of law, um, but um, uh, it's nowhere clear um, what the, um, how that will be implemented. <coughs> What's also notably absent in the economic community blueprint um, is what is vaguely implied by the phrase greater, quote, greater transparency in the public sector, unquote. What that would appear to refer to is effective regional and national regimes to combat corruption and to promote the development of a competent, impartial, an independent judiciary across ASEAN to implement and enforce the legal and regulatory regimes prescribed by the economic blueprint. However, just as the term the rule of law does not appear in the economic blueprint, so the term corruption also nowhere uh, appears in the economic blueprint. To find an indication of the role of the rule of law and anti-corruption initiatives in the scheme for community building over the next decade, we have to turn to the political security blueprint. Before we do that, before looking at the new blueprint, it's worthwhile looking at the previous blueprint that it replaces. Um, so in the 2009 ASEAN political and security community blueprint, we do find a recognition of the charter's principles of the rule of law, quote, the ASEAN political and security community shall promote development in adherence to the principles of democracy, the rule of law, and good governance, respect for and promotion and protection of human rights. 
So that's basically the terms of Articles 1 and 2 of the ASEAN Charter that, input it, that have been put into the blueprint. You will not find that in the new blueprint, more or less completely omitted. So in the 2009 blueprint, the relation of a rules-based community to the rule of law is actually, um, um, is actually fleshed out and provides a recognition of the importance of, quote, combating corruption and cooperation to strengthen the rule of law, judiciary systems, legal infrastructure, and good governance. That's in the 2009 blueprint. When we turn to the political and security community blueprint 2025, we find significant differences. Both blueprints contain a section that is entitled the same, characteristics and elements of the ASEAN political security community. And that's where in the 2009 blueprint we found those principles. In the blueprint 2025, on the other hand, the corresponding section has eliminated all references to democracy, good governance, and the rule of law. And what we find substituted are more general references to the creation of, quote, a rules-based, people-oriented, people-centered community bound by fundamental principles, end quotation, which principles are not specified in the blueprint. Even more striking than these omissions and the lack of specification of which fundamental principles are being referenced, the core of this section in the Political Security Blueprint 2025 does not mention the ASEAN Charter, which seems to me to be a rather striking omission when one compares it to the previous blueprint. When the rule of law does appear in the 2025 blueprint, which it does in one section, the treatment of this, what was a principle in the charter, um, is even um, more severely differentiated from the 2009 blueprint and the charter. So the only specific reference in the entire political security community blueprint to the rule of law is in a section entitled, quote, establishing programs for mutual support and assistance among ASEAN member states in the development of strategies for strengthening the rule of law, judicial systems, and legal infrastructure. That is the only reference. So, and the specification of what is actually to be accomplished entrusts the ASEAN law ministers meeting with developing what are called cooperation programs quote, to strengthen the rule of law, judicial systems, and legal infrastructure. So in other words, what was a fundamental charter principle now appears to have de devolved to a matter of mere technical cooperation, such as developing case management systems and other elements of legal infrastructure to improve performance um, in ASEAN. The close link of the rule of law with good governance, democracy, and the protection of human rights is entirely broken in the political security community blueprint 25 in comparison with the previous blueprint and with the charter. So what explains this apparent retreat from the robust treatment and prominence accorded the rule of law and good governance in the 2009 blueprint? If Ambassador Ong were here, he could tell us because he would know the answer um, because of his inside knowledge of what happens in ASEAN. So I can only speculate. But I think we can gain some insight by looking at a topic that was absent from the 2009 blueprint, or I mean, is mentioned but not dealt with, but which is included in quite great detail in the 2025 blueprint, and that's corruption, which perhaps surprisingly occupies a prominent place in the 2025 blueprint. 
Unlike the 2009 blueprint, in the 2025 blueprint, the drafters devoted a prominent and substantive section to combating corruption. The section mandates ASEAN member states to fully implement the 2004 Memorandum of Understanding on Cooperation in Combating Corruption, and it mandates them to take other concrete steps in implementing anti-corruption measures. So my guess would be that with the creation of the economic community, effective as of the 1st of January 2016, there is a recognition that combating corruption is essential to the achievement of key elements of the economic agenda specified in the AEC blueprint. The irony here is that rule of law and anti-corruption initiatives are two sides of the same coin. How, we might ask, can you have effective anti-corruption initiatives in a legal environment where the rule of law is absent? What would that look like? How you can't prosecute corruption in a, under a judiciary that is entirely governed by um, political interference, influence, and money. We only have to look at some recent events, for example, in Indonesia, where the Attorney General's office and the National Police have systematically tried to undermine the work of the National Anti-Corruption Commission, um, and to a significant degree, the courts have been ineffective in preventing that, um, to, see, um, to see how the rule of law is necessary to combat corruption, and how corruption is a corrosive force that undermines the rule of law and ultimately defeats good governance. So what this brief overview of the political security blueprint 2025 indicates to me is that at the regional level there is a recognition of the necessity of implementation of legally binding ASEAN instruments in order to create a rules-based community. There is a recognition of the importance of corruption um, in relation to achieving the goals of the economic community. But what is missing at the regional level is a structure for moving beyond a mere call for implementation of existing obligations. What is missing at the national level is any indication of how the rule of law necessary for a true rules-based community is to be achieved. So I think identification of these gaps raises two questions. At the regional level, can ASEAN develop a rules-based community without institutions to promulgate, interpret, and enforce a coherent body of rules? And by the way, we don't have a coherent body of rules in ASEAN yet. That is a coherent body of ASEAN law. Walter Woon in Singapore in a recent book has argued that ASEAN almost entirely lacks the infra institutional infrastructure for a regional rules-based community and he calls for the creation of a mechanism to fill that need. That's the regional level. At the national level, the question is, and this is a question you will never hear the ITER or various other ASEAN bodies ask, can ASEAN ever be a rules-based community without a far greater realization of the rule of law in each of its member states? This question presents itself with equal force in regard to the realization of basic human rights guaranteed by the ASEAN Charter and recognized in the Declaration and in the ASEAN 2025 Forging Ahead Together document. Because without the rule of law, the protection of human rights will necessarily remain an aspiration rather than a reality. What then, we might ask, is the current state of the rule of law in ASEAN? So, um, first of all, I could reference, if we had more time, a comprehensive report that was undertaken by the Human Rights Resource Center um, in Jakarta at the University of Indonesia, a baseline study on the rule of law in each of the 10 ASEAN member states, recently updated. But what I'll refer to instead as a very rough and ready way of answering the question of what is the state of the rule of law in ASEAN are some global rankings which although there's a lot of 
discussion as to how accurate they are, I think they can provide some rough guidelines um, for us. So in the left-hand column, um, we have the um, uh, World Justice Project rankings in regard to the rule of law. In the middle column, we have the Transparency International Corruption Index. And in the far right column, we have the World Bank Ease of Doing Business rankings. So what we can see here is the relationship between rule of law, corruption, and ease of doing business. And as we would expect, of course, um, Singapore, um, Brunei wasn't surveyed. Um, Singapore is the only ASEAN member state um, that um, stands in the top tier of nations worldwide um, in regard to all three of these indices. And we see, of course, I mean, you see at the bottom the number of surveyed. So Cambodia, 99 out of 102 surveyed in regard to the rule of law. One, um, Cambodia, 100, and uh, Lao wasn't surveyed in the rule of law study. Um, uh, Cambodia, 150 out of 168. Myanmar, 147. Lao PDR 139, um, uh, et cetera. And then we can see um, the rough correlations that we have between the ease of doing business and the um, corruption and rule of law, rule of law rankings, which I think underscores the point that I was making about the relationship of the rule of law to the development of the ASEAN economic, ASEAN economic community. So again, we might ask, how can ASEAN achieve the rule of law promised in the Charter when, with few exceptions, very few, it is so far from being achieved at the national level across ASEAN? So, and this will be the final sort of section of my talk, and we can turn to discussion. What, the way we might look at that question is what ASEAN body has the responsibility of dealing with the rule of law mandate of the Charter. Now, my first reaction was, and when I was doing the research for this paper, well, wouldn't it be the ICER, the ASEAN Intergovernmental Human Rights Commission? That institution would appear to have a mandate to develop the rule of law because the ICER is the, it has been officially designated as the overarching human rights body for ASEAN um, that covers all area um, of human rights. The mandate of the ICER is the promotion and protection of human rights. And as I've argued already, human rights cannot be protected without a system of law and the administration of justice that is free from corruption, interference, and manipulation by political, governmental, economic, and private interests. Civil and political rights, economic and social rights, environmental rights, and all the rest depend upon a coherent, fair, accessible, and authoritative legal order that it can force the laws and provide reparations and punishment for criminal conduct and wrongdoing and redress for violations of the rights of citizens. How, we might ask then, has the ICER designated as the ASEAN human rights body with an overarching mandate dealt with the rule of law? Well, let's look first at the TOR, the terms of reference for the ICER. The terms of reference make clear the relevance of the rule of law to its mandate. Quote, the ICER shall be guided by the following principles. A, adherence to the rule of law, good governance, the principles of democracy, and constitutional government, end quote. Again, essentially, the principles of Articles 1 and 2 of the, of the Charter. If we look at the two ICER work plans, ICER is now in its second work plan, the rule of law does not appear in the first work plan, nor do the terms good governance, democracy, or constitutional government. Basically, the first work plan almost completely avoided civil and political rights and the rule of law in particular. 
the new work plan, that's the 2016 to 2020 ITER work plan, reaffirms the ITER's commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights, but again, there is no reference anywhere in the new work plan to the rule of law. If we look at the ITER website and the ASEAN Secretary website, it appears that ITER activities have not focused either on the rule of law or on core civil and political rights associated with good governance and constitutional government. In other words, although the TOR creates a plain mandate for dealing with the rule of law and associated charter principles, to date the ITER has, included, has not included this topic among its thematic studies or core activities. It's two current priority activities in its long work plan, which I think has 12 or 15 elements, are um, the drafting of a persons with disabilities um, uh, convention um, for ASEAN and the implementation of the ASEAN Convention on Trafficking um, in Persons. The ITER to date has completed one thematic study, which is on corporate social responsibility. If we look at this CSR baseline study, it, that study makes the absence of the rule of law from the ITER agenda even more puzzling. The CSR baseline study recognizes, for example, what it calls Singapore's unique status in ASEAN in regard to the achievement of the rule of law and anti-corruption, indicating Singapore as the example of the economic benefits of such a regime. Although the ITER CSR study suggests that transparency and anti-corruption should be, quote, high on the agenda, why do they in fact find no place in the ITER agenda and work plan? What is also notably absent in these sections of the ITER baseline study on CSR is a recognition that predictability and certainty in legal institutions are also key components both of which are critically undermined by corruption. The absence of the rule of law and strong anti-corruption anti institutions enables the kind of corruption alluded to by the study in that such a situation compels investors either to engage in corrupt practices in order to secure licenses, contracts, and generally function in a corrupt business environment or to abstain from investment altogether. The CSR study vaguely alludes to such issues, but they were apparently considered too sensitive and too subject to the ASEAN consensus rule by which the ITER operates to be addressed directly in the CSR study. So um, just in the final two minutes or so um, of the time I wanted to talk and so as to leave enough time for discussion, what what can we conclude from this overview? First, the lack of institutional mechanisms to instantiate the Charter's principles of the rule of law and good governance appears clearly from a survey of the treatment of such issues in the ASEAN Blueprints 2025 and in the work plan of the ITER. Second, equally apparent is the importance of developing the rule of law at both the regional and national levels for the for the success of the ASEAN economic community in realizing its full potential and in fulfilling the promises of the ASEAN leaders and the charter and the blueprints of providing shared prosperity to peoples of ASEAN. Walter Woon's suggestion of the creation of an independent institution, which he terms an ASEAN legal service, deserves careful consideration by, uh, by relevant ASEAN bodies Although, as he acknowledges, and I think as we would all know, we're unlikely to see such an institution for many years, if not many decades. That's at the regional level. At the national level, significant changes and legal reforms in many ASEAN member states will likely be necessary before they're willing to go down the path towards the reality of a rules-based community based upon the rule of law rather than the repetition of this phrase as a soothing mantra, because everywhere one goes in ASEAN, we hear rules-based community, rules-based community, people-centered ASEAN, people-oriented ASEAN, it all sounds wonderful. 
If ASEAN leaders aim to put substance behind the promises of the ASEAN Vision 2025, they will have to address both endemic corruption in many ASEAN member states and the absence of rule of law at the national level. In sum, it's time for ASEAN member states to get serious about the rule of law and the corruption that undercuts the promise of prosperity for a people-centered ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you.